back. Uh, pleased to uh, start our next session here, our research to practice panel. I'm John Staley. I'm director of outreach and continuing education at the North Carolina Occupational Safety and Health Education Research Center and the SBH core faculty in the Gilling School of Global Public Health at University of North Carolina. And I'm pleased to be joined uh, by my co-moderator, Dr. Thomas Bernard, who's the director of the Sunshine Education Research Center at the University of South Florida and also a professor there. So it's really exciting building on the momentum uh, earlier this morning of the South On uh, speaker, keynote speaker, Steve Tucker with Beam Suntory. And it, it's amazing when you think about, for probably many of us, the path that you got to to get here where you are now, whether a researcher, practitioner, somewhere in between, perhaps you never expected it. If uh, people had said that about me, uh, that I'd be where I am now, I, 10 years ago, I would have said you're crazy being in the academic setting, but here I am. So as I said, it's really exciting to be uh, discussing in this panel today. Yesterday, if you remember, we had the industry panel talking about COVID impact on industries and businesses in various sectors. And today, we're now looking at the research to practice and impact on uh, the various uh, areas here with our panelists today, which it's really exciting to have panelists panelists representing epidemiology, departments of health, uh, AIHA and ACGIH, which uh, bodies uh, overseeing industrial hygiene, if you're not familiar with that field. And, and just briefly to mention that it's exciting that we've got, uh, we, we did have planned Dr. Glenn Morris uh, as one of our panelists, but unfortunately he can't join us today, but he does send his regrets uh, he's on a flight back home from Texas, which we know Texas has been hard hit by uh, the recent winter storms and continues to be. So we wish him safe travels. But among our panelists, we have Dr. Kesha Reed, uh, who will be speaking to us first here shortly, who's Director of Public Health Research at the Florida Department of Health. We also have Philip Rauscher, who is the American Conference of Governmental Industrial Hygienists Senior Director of Science, Education, and Publications. Then we also have uh, Mr. Donald Elswick, who serves as the Executive Director, University of Alabama, Safe State Division of Industrial and Environmental Programs. And then we, our final speaker panelist, but certainly not uh, least, is Dr. Stephanie Lynch, who's an Industrial Hygiene Project, Product Manager with OHD, which I believe is uh, formerly Occupational Health Dynamics uh, in Birmingham, Alabama. So when we think about research to practice before we start, uh, I'll give you a couple of ground rules prior. Each panelist will uh, share their insights and background and their challenges and things they faced with COVID with research to practice for about 15 minutes. And we'll go se sequentially. And then after that, we'll open it up for question and answer as we build on this. So if you're not really familiar with the concept, just to give you a little background, research to practice, this is a very common approach from NIOSH, National Institutes of Occupational Safety and Health. When we think about how are we going to use or adopt or adapt uh, NIOSH knowledge into practical interventions, you know, you're building that, using that research to build the necessary interventions or make policy changes or change technologies and make upgrades in the workplace. And that's certainly relevant today as we think about the lightning speed that we've had to design programs and set up our plans for communication and implementing um, changes because of COVID and safety in the workplace, particularly with essential and underserved workers, right? And as well as thinking about evaluation of those programs. So again, it's, it's my pleasure to get us started here. So as I mentioned, our first speaker is Dr. Kesha Reed. As I said, is Director of Public Health Research at the Florida Department of Health. And she oversees biomedical research there, as well as several non-infectious disease surveillance and epidemiology programs. And she earned her doctoral degree from the Department of Sociology at Florida State University in 2013, and then started shortly thereafter at the Florida Department of Health, working in various epidemiological capacities. So uh, Dr. Reed, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, John. Um, as John mentioned, I'm the Director of Public Health Research at the Florida Department of Health, and I'm also the Principal Investigator of the NIOSH-funded state-based Occupational Health and Safety Surveillance Program in Florida. 
For a little bit of background, the Florida Department of Health is nationally accredited by the Public Health Accreditation Board and is a fully integrated public health system with local health departments in each of Florida's 67 counties. This structure allows for a unified approach in responding to public health issues such as the coronavirus pandemic. Um, Florida's Occupational Health and Safety Surveillance Program sits in the department's central office in Tallahassee, Florida. The program has been funded since 2010 and is currently in a sixth supplemental year of funding. This past December, we reapplied for a new five-year funding cycle through NIOSH that will begin in July 2021. We're a small program. Um, in addition to myself, we have one full-time equivalent program manager slash epidemiologist and one part-time program assistant, although we are hoping to grow this out over the next couple of years with our new funding cycle and get some additional staff on board. But the goals of our occupational health and safety surveillance program are really focused on characterizing work-related injuries and illnesses through surveillance data, and then using that data to inform prevention activities that will improve the health and safety of Florida's workforce. So we conduct surveillance of various occupational injuries, illnesses, and fatalities using a variety of data sources. Um, we then disseminate those findings to partners and stakeholders. We work collaboratively both within the Department of Health and with others throughout the state. We help develop prevention and intervention activities, and we also assist with adult blood lead poisoning outreach, investigation, and intervention support to each of our 67 county health departments. So we do have a lot going on despite being a smaller program. Um, we strive to provide, create, and foster resources and partnerships to address occupational health and safety issues across the state. So for us, collaboration is key, um, leveraging our partnerships and our stakeholders and building our network within state, local, and national, uh, with state, local, and national partners has really been instrumental to our successes and what we've been able to achieve. With regard to COVID-19, we were and continue to be involved in the response in Florida, as I think uh, most public health programs have been in one way or another. From an agency-wide perspective, our COVID-19 response strategy is focused really heavily on messaging about the importance of basic public health measures in COVID-19 prevention. Um, there was also an emphasis on social distancing, testing and contact tracing, um, vulner and vulnerable populations, such as the elderly or the medical, medically vulnerable. Most of the department's programs, including the Occupational Health and Safety Program, fell in line with this larger approach by helping to push out messaging and resources with a focus on vulnerable populations that were unique to our respective program areas. While our program doesn't necessarily interact with employers and workers and populations whose health we're looking to improve, as many of our public health programs do, we were still involved in a lot of ways that built off of the strengths of a surveillance program. Um, so I wanted to just share some examples of how we were involved, how we tried to push out things through our partners, how um, we used our surveillance data or other tools that we, we have through our program to help out with the response. So one of the first things that we did in the Occupational Health and Safety Program early in the pandemic was share resources that the department was developing with our various partners and stakeholders. Uh, for example, some of you may be familiar with Florida's COVID-19 data dashboard. It displays COVID-19 case and testing numbers at the state, county, and zip code level, and it's updated daily. So it's a really useful tool to visualize the status of COVID geographically and think about resources and messaging, where resources and messaging may be needed. Um, so we sent this link out to our university partners, members of our Occupational Illness Injury Coalition, and others who we thought may find it useful as they're thinking about the populations that they work with. In a similar vein, we sent out links to the department's COVID-19 website, which had information about testing sites, latest data, and other need-to-know information, um, including pages that were specifically designated for healthcare workers and businesses and employers. So we wanted to make sure that everyone had this information, they could send it out so that there was a valuable, um, valid, reliable source for everyone to go to. We also worked hard to send out messaging and guidance resources developed by both the department and the CDC, particularly infographics. So in addition to distributing those that address general COVID-19 information that would probably be relevant to everybody, um, for example, should I get tested for COVID? What do I do if I've been in close contact with someone who has COVID? We also took an industry specific approach. So we pulled infographics and documents that were developed for specific worker populations like essential workers or small businesses. 
we reviewed materials and flagged those that we thought were applicable to specific industries and then shared those out. Um, as an example, there was a guidance document developed for those living in close, close quarters. So that was one that we flagged that might be particularly relevant for migrant farm workers who may be living in situations like that. We would also periodically review the materials the department had and some of those on the CDC website um, to determine if there were any updates needed to the materials that we had in hand based on the changing landscape of the pandemic as we were learning more and more about COVID. Again, our goal here was really just to get these resources into the hands of our partners and stakeholders, as well as our county health departments, so they could in turn push out this information to relevant worker populations that they had more contact with than we would. Um, we also made sure that we were providing these resources in Spanish and Creole to be as inclusive as possible of our non-English speakers throughout the state. Another example of an activity we engaged in was a collaborative project with the department's environmental public health tracking program. The occupational program manager and the tracking program worked together to develop an interactive online map that depicted vulnerable housing and industry populations across the state. Using data from multiple sources, including um, the Florida Housing Data Clearinghouse, the quarterly census of employment and wages, and the American Community Survey, they were able to provide a resource that showed where things like farm worker assisted housing was located throughout the state. Um, and it depicted counties with high numbers of particular workers like landscaping or crop workers that we wanted to make sure um, that we were sharing so that if that was a population that was of concern to somebody, they knew where to be distributing resources. We've also stayed engaged with national, state, and local partners throughout the pandemic. So we regularly participate in the Council for State and Territorial Epidemiologist Occupational Health Subcommittee. Um, they had a call specifically dedicated toward COVID-19 coordination and collaboration. So we've made sure to be a part of that. We join a monthly call with the University of Florida Institute of Food and Agricultural Sciences, um, focusing on addressing COVID-19 in the contract worker population particularly agriculture and migrant workers. So we continue to be involved in that. And these activities allow us to stay informed of updates in the field and serve as a resource wherever we can to our different partners. Um, other ways that we've been involved have included providing technical assistance to researchers throughout the state who are seeking Florida specific data on worker populations to address COVID in various ways. Um, that's something that we normally do, but we've taken it now from a little bit more of a COVID approach because there has been a lot of research dedicated specifically to COVID um, and people have been seeking worker data. So we've been trying to help put people in touch with those different resources that we're aware of. Um, and then a lot of, even though there's only a few staff members dedicated to the occupational program, um, we have all taken turns being deployed out to assist with the department's COVID call center, or contact tracing or other activities. Um, so we've been rotating out and doing that as much as possible to help sort of keep things going because it's basically been an all hands on deck approach. Of course, through all of this, we were also still trying to maintain our regular programmatic duties uh, to make sure that we weren't neglecting traditional occupational health focus areas. Uh, because we were so focused on COVID at the time, we wanted to make sure that those things continued running as smoothly as possible. Uh, we were still working on our grant applications and things like that. Um, so, you know, we were, we were, it was a little bit of a struggle, a challenge to keep going with everything that we needed to regularly and then um, also dive into the COVID stuff, but we were able to do it in a, in a really strong way. Um, moving forward, we do plan to monitor trends in our standard occupational health data to see if there are going to be any longer term impacts from the pandemic. Um, so thinking about changes in worker populations or specific injuries or illnesses, particularly as people who lost work due to COVID return to the workforce. Um, so those data tend to lag a little bit, but we will be keeping an eye on those things as we go to make sure um, that we're aware of these longer term impacts and can be thinking about those as we're planning future activities through our program. So um, that's all I had. I um, am really glad that we got the opportunity to share this with this group today because again, being a smaller program, um, we were involved, but we we're often probably not thought of as sort of the forefront of the COVID response at the department. So um, I'm, I'm glad to be here today. Right, thanks so much, Kesha. Um, we'll continue on and we'll move uh, to our next speaker. And in his role as Senior Director of Science, Education and Publications with the American Conference of Governmental Industrial Hygienists, uh, Phil Rauscher coordinates volunteers and staff members' efforts to ensure high-level education as well as publications and committee operation 
uh, for wide range of activities there for the industrial hygiene profession. He's also a certified industrial hygienist and certified safety professional. And he's done extensive work assisting employers of various industries with development of safety programs and implementing best practice guidelines, as well as facilitating um, online and in-person education. So I'm pleased to uh, turn this over to uh, Phil. Thanks, Dr. Staley. Yeah, so um, it, ACGIH just being what it is and being the entity that it is, um, it, it, it was already in a unique position before COVID was was ever a thing, right? Um, you know, it's, it's this collection of aerosol scientists and toxicologists and research veterinarians and, you know, professionals who have done extensive research in, uh, you know, respiratory protection. So, um, you know, we, we kind of had the components already there to make a switch over and and turn the conversation to COVID. So, um, you know, my presentation kind of walks hand in hand with what we were doing and some of the supplemental activities that are out there to help people with a COVID response. And your science. Um, and it, it, uh, so, sorry. Um, and it's been to advance the careers of professionals working in occupational hygiene, uh, and environmental health. And a, a big thing we've been leaning into, uh, lately is that environmental health side, um, you know, working with total worker health and the idea that, you know, you go home from work and you're still exposed. Uh, my brother-in-law is a, a Mason. Uh, so he, he does that all day. Um, guess what you do for a, a little bit of extra cash? You do it on Saturday for somebody that has a job that isn't quite big enough for, for what, you know, to, to hire a contractor for. So, you know, this idea that you're continuing to be exposed to things once you get outside the work environment is something that it, for our future plans is something we uh, are, are going to be leaning into. Um you know, how are we made up? I, I made sure this one was first and foremost for this particular talk. Um, our bioaerosols committee. So if if you got a TLV book for the longest time, there was a delay that, uh, you know, there was the section in the back, the BDACs, it, it didn't have any limits. Um, the committee kind of fell out of uh, fashion, it was there, but they weren't, they, they weren't very active. Uh, within the last two years, this committee has, really had a huge revitalization. Um, so, you know, obviously they, they got thrown right in. Uh, they came in at the perfect time for a global pandemic. If there's ever a good time for one, this committee was there for it. Um, right now, their, their primary focus is updating the Purple Book, um, the Bioaerosols Assessment and Control Book. And, you know, they're, they're chugging right on through it, but they have worked extensively and continue to do work to make sure that, you know, the aerosol side of the pandemic is, is well understood. Um, BIs, if you've ever gone through the book, this one on that environmental health side is, is a committee that we plan to lean into heavily. Uh, so they have um, in the, in the, second part of the TLV book, they produce limits that may come from urine, blood, you know, some way that's uh, measures directly body burden or as direct as you can, right? So, um, you know, as we lean into this idea that your, your workday might, your definitely doesn't end eight hours in from start, uh, you know, how do you know for sure what somebody's body burden is by just sampling throughout the day? Well, you know, the, the BIs come in and supplement the TLVs that way. Uh, industrial ventilation committee, very busy year for them. Uh, you know, the, the first thing that happened and it actually started from a email that came into science at acgih.org. Uh, you know, that, that came in and I immediately turned to the chair of the committee, John Hale and asked, uh, you know, what, what are we going to tell people about this? We, we don't really understand how it's carrying in the air. We don't understand what's going on. Um, is it dangerous to use a desk fan now? Uh, and so uh, immediately they pivoted and within a couple months had a white paper out that explained, okay, here are, here's what happens. This is how air current works. 
um, with the hope that people who, you know, don't do think about it daily, um, how micro changes in the environment change how airflow is going to go. You know, what do they have to do about this? Uh, how does dilution ventilation work in a time of COVID where you're not sure what the infectious dose is? Um, you know, what are the best practices that can be followed right here, right now? Um, the TLV committee. So if if you've never picked up a TLV book, they set limits for chemical substances. You know, how, how does this make a switch over to what's happening with COVID? Uh, you know, they seem like they should be a, a whole world apart. But in reality, um, if you look to the back of the TLV book this year for 2021, uh, biologically derived airborne contaminants is now biological agents. Uh, and the two agents that were under study before with the bioaerosols committee, they sat down with chem subs and said, you know, hey, you've got cotton dust. Endotoxin was already part of that TLV. You guys have experience with these, these things that are biologically derived. They're not exactly a chemical per se, but they act like a chemical in the way that they interact with the body. Um, so this year in the understudy list for chem subs, Gram negative bacterial endotox is there. Uh, 1 3 beta D glucan there. Um, and that last section in the TLV book is going over to, you know, what, what are the actual measurable biological agents and what limits should we put in place for those rather than a derivative of those agents? Uh, physical agents. So, you know, they're famous. Uh, noise, heat, cold, uh, all the physical agents, they, they're out there working on them. Um, a big shift that they did, and I was really proud of this group, some research that came in said, hey, you know, we're using UVC. All of a sudden, UV was this big thing that everybody was purposefully buying and throwing everywhere, right? Um, if you shine UV on a surface, all of a sudden, it's magically clean. Uh, but the manufacturers of these things were saying, you know, this narrow band that we're using for the COVID outbreak, um, it's it, your TLV doesn't sync with the newest science. Um, and they took that feedback and said, you know, you're absolutely right. This, this newest research that we're seeing, this 222 band that we're commonly using for COVID doesn't interact the way we say it does. So, you know, over the course of the summer, they did a quick switch, changed around the UV TLV and said, hey, you know, this is our new limit, came out with an NIC document within a couple months of the pandemic happening to better serve people. So um, for the first time in over a decade, we sat down, did strategic planning and said, okay, where are we going? In the middle of COVID, let's plan for the future. Let's see what we want to do. And, and we kind of got back to the basics. We said, how can we help occupational health, environmental health professionals advance their career? Um, how can we get the best education and professional development to these people? How do we make sure they're getting up-to-date information in their publications? You know, how do we make getting the TLV easier? Um, right now, it's cost prohibitive to send a TLV book just about anywhere outside of the United States. Even to Western Europe, all of a sudden, the shipping is more than the book itself. So how do we combat that? You know, how do we go online? How do we push this information to anywhere where an ethernet cable is run? Um, you know, how do, we, how do we switch to virtual volunteerism? We can't get together and we don't know when we're gonna get together. Uh, don't know when we're gonna have a conference to get together. Everything went digital. So, you know, re-engaging people, bringing people in, giving them ways to contribute was a, was a big part of that plan. Um, you know, uh, so how do we do it? And the cool thing with all of our scientists already pushing good science is you just apply good science to COVID. And we were already doing many of these things uh, with just a, a little twist put on top. So, you know, what do we have the action level? Uh, if anybody sat down and read JOEH lately, um, there are a ton of articles all of a sudden about N95 fit. Uh, how aerosols are blocked, do face shields work? Um, we were, and we were poised ready. The second that research is ready for a journal, we're putting it out and you know, we're giving people CM points to read that and participate in it and really you know, make sure that they are up to date on the newest science that's out there. Um, switched over to virtual learning. You know, this year we have a learning pass that's based you know, 
on the success of last year's summer series. We did an eight part series on COVID and the response early on that um, Dr. Lisa Brousseau had it up. Uh, you know, we're, we're still continuing to get people those documentations and their complimentary TLV books to make sure that they're in the best place to have a healthy workforce during COVID and coming out of it. Um, <laughs> everyone here could appreciate this. We have a light black and red uh, cover this year uh, since we're based in the state of Ohio. Uh, but, um, you know, we pushed up that 2021 TLV book to December because we knew everybody was having a hard enough time already to try to start a, an industrial hygiene program with the newest TLVs in March is just one more speed bump that people have to go through. Um, the industrial vent book right now, they're in a period where they're, they're getting ready for the next edition. And you better believe that a number of the conversations they're having is okay. Outside of the industrial, uh, sphere how is this being used you know we, we've seen that now people have to design for these other environments where they're trying to you know figure out how to apply these principles to healthcare. so it's in there um a number of pdcs are coming out this year noise biomonitoring to help supplement some of this stuff um as I said, we're having a number of webinars that are coming out that are, you know, just reinforcing some of the, the traditional IH roles and making it hopefully a little bit easier. We did just have another webinar on the use of respirators in the time of COVID and, you know, how that's been, how the rollout is, some of the shortfalls of applying that stuff. Uh, we continue to have the FIV course. It's been successful. Um, and, you know, it, that even that there was a pivot that's it's got an additional uh two hour session that we've added to the middle of the class on applying the principles to COVID. um they did a case study in class with a crack door to increase the amount of outside air and you know they were successful the people by the door were a little bit chilly because it was november and in ohio but they you know they they showed this is some things you can do and some things to think about in your workplace. Um, have a couple more coming up in Chicago that will be part of it until you know, people give us the feedback that you know, it's it's past that. Um, and you know, where do we fit in this? And it's really cool. Like, uh, this is a big sandbox, we're all playing in it, right? And and I can see our role. So AIHA is doing a great job. They're out there representing the profession, making sure people see this stuff, making sure that, you know, these workplaces are using some of the best practices, you know, their, their outreach program right now is, is doing very well. Um, BGC is keeping us all honest. Uh, you know, they're, they've got an enforceable code of ethics that we all have to remember through this. Don't go too far outside your sphere, wherever you get uncomfortable pulling somebody else. And then our role is, you know, let's, let's feed the beast. Let's get professionals this science so that they can use it once they're out there. Um, you know, if, if any of this sounded great, go ahead, sign up for membership. I encourage everybody new this year. Student memberships are 100% complimentary to make sure that students, you know, get this information, are fed it, know how to get to it and understand, you know, they get their 10 free documentations. They get a free TLV book. We want students to come out and be comfortable with handling our, our um, knowledge and our science on day one of work. So, um, I encourage everybody to go sign up for one of those, all the students. Um, follow us on all of the social meds. Um, we're, we're constantly pushing stuff. So, All right. Thanks, Phil. And it's an interesting balance with the uh, volume of information that's come out, not only with COVID, but balancing that with existing occupational safety and health. And uh, my wife will definitely appreciate the Ohio State uh, <laughs> colors of the TLV manual. So she's a big, uh, she and her family are big Buckeye fans. And I learned a terrible mistake when I thought it'd be funny to give her family Michigan uh, Ooh. Uh, Ooh, clothes no, no. for Christmas. No, 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 no. Not a good idea. So <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Phil. Um, so now we'll move on to our next panelist, uh, 
uh, who he has over 30 years of government and multi-industry experience, a variety of senior positions in environmental health and safety. Uh, he's currently executive director of University of Alabama Safe State, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Don Elswick. And he's a certified industrial hygienist, certified safety professional, certified environmental trainer, and has held a variety of positions uh, and has a wealth of experience and also retired as commander in the United States Navy, having served as 30, uh, a medical service corps officer in surface warfare for 32 years. So uh, we appreciate your service, Don, and I'll turn it over to you. Great, then. I appreciate uh, the invitation to join everyone today. I got to tell you, Dr. Reed and Phil really set me up well because, again, we're positioned in Alabama, our Deep South uh, Center, and also uh, ACGIH, AIHA, and even ASSP have been a great partner. Uh, here's our information, but I wanted to let you know kind of our mission is to promote occupational environmental safety throughout our university-based program, and really that's done with continuing education. We really look at uh, career enhancement and also uh, applied research and technical assistance. So one of the things as you're looking at our mission, you may say, Don, that, that's a really pretty uh, mission. How does that really fit into things? Well, it's real simple. We have three functions that are aligned with the University of Alabama, which a couple of Ohio State fans may know since we were talking about it, the University of Alabama, which was the national champion. So I just got to add that in football. Uh, we are teaching research and service. So as you look at our particular mission, we are out there and we do have contact with some of the employers. We get the questions and quite frankly, we are the ones who try to solve problems throughout. And one of the areas, what I tried to do with this discussion is set up for all participants, areas that no matter where you are, we provide the service but I hope throughout this, you realize these are services that are provided in your area. And one of the areas I wanted to highlight is our OSHA consultation 21D. And again, I hope you notice the capital letters there. This is a free service in any state. OSHA funds this for high hazard, and in particular, those industries that don't have the resources in safety and health. And again, that partnership with the uh, professional organizations, we've been able to provide virtual and on-site consultation. And that's really important because that virtual has allowed people to come to us, sit down, discuss things. And then we were fortunate enough, we were one of the programs, our university saw a way that we could actually still go out protect our 10 consultants as they were going out and providing services, and also provide webinar, webinars on COVID-19, in particular, pandemic planning and uh, also developing those plans. So again, this was an area we were very involved. We had the risk communication, we had the email blast. We were fortunate enough to be able to share the OSHA information. And occasionally, guess what? We even did some air sampling and some wipe sampling. Now the slide's a little bit small here, and I know it may be hard to read, but the bottom line to this is, we definitely want you to recognize the hazards in your workplace. So when consultants go out, I mentioned it was free. It's also confidential. People worry that, okay, you're gonna turn this information over to OSHA if you find something. There is a firewall that is only breached on one occasion when someone refuses to correct a serious hazard or something that could actually uh, cause a serious injury or fatality. The other thing I wanted to mention to you also is we give you the re uh, written report and we don't just hand you the report, we're there afterwards to provide training, education. As you well know, during this pandemic, 
we've been able to use uh, some of the ACGIH publications and some of AIHA's publication. Phil mentioned the ventilation paper that was just absolutely pivotal to our consultants being able to give, you know, information on ventilation. So we really appreciated that. And then the other thing, uh, sometimes we have programs where we, our STAR program, where you actually move into a higher level of compliance and also your regulatory uh, risk is lowered. So I just, uh, wherever you are, go to the consul, go to OSHA consultation, think about these services. If you're a researcher like we are, definitely support the consultation services. With that research in mind, we also provide environmental services. We actually have uh, our consultation services started in 1977. This environmental service was not far behind and we currently have EPA contracts, US EPA contracts for lead, asbestos, AHERA and pollution prevention. I wanna mention three of these bullets in particular that have been very important to our services. The first one is, as you look at it, the maintenance, the custodians, especially in school. We have had so many requests, and I can't say enough, our research, our development, we have the infection uh, control uh, professionals at UAB. We have many people that are do with our Office of Research here at University of Alabama that have helped protect this really vulnerable population. And in a way, we provide a great service. The other thing too, if you look at bullet number five, we talk about cleaning. In particular, as you all know, in every area of the country, there has been suddenly, I am uh, Joe's cleaning company or Sue's cleaning company, and we've had a lot of questions. And, you know, the basic is cover the list in EPA chemicals, but also what should we look for in companies doing that? And in particular, one of the areas that we're using is the very dart system where ventilation systems and filtration, which is bullet number seven there. If you look at that, that's an area for testing and evaluating. And again, coming from a research side and really it has applications and we've used those. The next area, and what a great resource we have with the OSHA training institutes. You know, we're all about our mission, our primary mission is teaching. And these research institutes, and we're fortunate enough to have the OSHA Training Institute here at the University of Alabama. And I just listed three courses that have been what I call packed. And this is face-to-face, -face, virtual. Any way we offer these courses, we have lots of interest. And it, again, you have OTIs in your area. I know many of the ERCs are located near some of these. Please go out, look at this pandemic illness planning. It was an older course from 2009. Most centers have updated it with new information, including a lot of the uh, professional guidance. Also, the record keeping rule seminar. As we know, we had lots of industries with questions. And then the last one, of course, was the respiratory course. So I've mentioned a lot to you, and I heard a couple of pre, uh, speakers previously discuss communication. I really want to take some time and have you take about two minutes, watch this video. It is a My Simple Show video, and it we've used it to communicate, and in particular, the hierarchy of control, which we're all familiar with, but to really use it to explain how is this relevant to the pandemic. So I'm gonna ask him if you don't mind, please start the video if you could. University of Alabama. UA Safe State's number one priority is supporting our client's goal of workers returning home safely. Because of this, companies are more productive with fewer health, safety, and environmental incidents. UA Safe State considers accomplishing these goals our primary mission. 
Since 1978, the experts at UA Safe State have worked with companies, municipalities, and organizations to find effective solutions to challenging environmental and occupational safety and health problems. We have created this educational video on hierarchy of control to help businesses eliminate pandemic risks to employees. During this training, you will understand how to apply the hierarchy of controls in the pandemic to control organizational risks. We apply the hierarchy of controls to identify hazards, assess risks, and protect people. Hazard elimination is physically removing the hazard with vaccinations and transmission prevention through isolation of the virus. Substitution is the act of replacing a given hazard with something less hazardous, or administering a drug that interferes with the virus's ability to replicate. Engineering controls include isolating people from a hazard, placing barriers such as a plexiglass transaction window at a bank or store. Administrative controls include changing the way people work or act, this includes personal hygiene like washing hands, surface disinfection, limiting the size of gatherings, keeping at least six feet of separation between people and customers. All of these protective measures are more subject to variability because they depend upon people being compliant. Personal protective equipment, PPE, the last resort in the hierarchy of control. PPE is safety and health equipment that puts a barrier between the worker and the biohazard, which can be another person. PPE includes gloves, masks, eye protection, and clothing. The prevalent use of lower level controls in responding to COVID-19 highlights the importance of using this framework. While administrative controls and PPE can mitigate some risks while we're waiting for more effective solutions, it's critical to reassess every possible option in the hierarchy of control as leaders continue taking action throughout this health emergency. We hope this video has been useful and informative. If you have any questions related to environmental, safety, occupational health, and training, feel free to contact UA Safe State. I thought it uh, was going through. I had another source. I think they uh, were able to add on that. I, I thought heard it on my other device. So I hope you guys understand what that video. What we really did was take something that we felt was very important. In other words, in our teaching, in our research, in our service, and communicate that out to our clients. And we were requested several of those videos on uh, face coverings, on the hierarchy of control and other things. And we just found this an excellent way to communicate. And we've even had partners use that. So again, all the videos that we have are up on our YouTube website. They're free for use. And if you have, we have other COVID related videos on vaccinations and other things that we have made available. So again, I just appreciate the time to share that with you all. And also just to mention, again, it takes a partnership and we really appreciate the ERC in our area, Deep South, as I'm sure many of the participants do. And please, if you're an emerging professional, Go out, you know, look at the careers at uh, in occupational safety and health. I think you're already there. And just look at some of the professional membership. So with that, John, I'll turn it back over to you and say uh, thanks again for the opportunity and looking forward to questions. Thanks so much, Don. That was uh, really good to hear that overview of your activities. Um, our final panelist that we'll go to, uh, again, as I said earlier, is an industrial hygiene product manager for OHD in Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, Dr. Stephanie Lynch uh, has a background in industrial hygiene and occupational safety across multiple industries and is also a researcher with broad knowledge of respiratory protection, which we know has been big the last several months, as well as fit testing. 
And with this background, uh, she focuses on a research advancing uh, OHD's partnership with a variety of regulatory agencies and fosters new product development initiatives. Uh, working uh, closely with their partners and customers and uh, with a variety of expertise in very varied product applications. So now I'm, I'm pleased to turn it over to Dr. Lynch. Thanks, John. Um, I also need to start off by thanking the Deep South Center for inviting me. Uh, I'm actually a proud graduate of the center and I have truly enjoyed the symposium thus far. A little bit more about my background just because being inspired about people talking about how you end up where you are. Um, I got my master's in industrial hygiene from UAB after actually getting my bachelor's in philosophy because I fancied myself a real intellectual. Um, but I was working a job as an industrial hygiene technician and my mother was also um, working at the School of Public Health. So when I was finishing up with my bachelor's degree, I thought, man, what, what am I gonna do? And I realized I was enjoying my job as an industrial hygiene technician. So why not jump into that, right? So I got that master's from industrial hygiene and I spent my thesis research time at that point working on evaluations of respirator fit testing panels and also methodologies. And one of those methodologies is actually OHD's controlled negative pressure, which is who I work for now. But for a year there, right after I graduated with that master's, I went and actually worked for NIOSH at the National Personal Protective Technologies Laboratory in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And at that time, we were actually doing research on respirators and fit testing. Those respirators were from the stockpile. And that was one aspect of the known to be eventual pandemic preparation uh, efforts. Uh, which clearly we, we have a long way to go, but we were already making some preparations and I, I was proud to be a part of that then. But so after that, I actually went and got a second master's and my PhD from Auburn and I performed my dissertation research on quantifying the ergonomic risk factors within a Southeastern logging population. And so I've really enjoyed all the aspects of the symposium that have had to do with agriculture because I really do think that that group's been um, terribly neglected really. And so it's just been really interesting. Um, but so for those of you who don't know, and it's been mentioned, but OHD, the company I now work for, most notably manufactures and sells a quantitative respirator fit testing device, and it's called the QuantiFit. And we're a little bit different from the other methods because we utilize what I mentioned is our um, patented controlled negative pressure technology to challenge the respirator with air instead of using particles. Uh, we also recently released our new QuantiFit 2, and it didn't change anything about our technology, but it aimed to upgrade our users, users' experience. And so because of that market that we're in, we participate in and perform various research studies on fit testing. And pre-COVID, I don't think that we saw exactly um, how critical we could become in a pandemic response because for instance, at one point, a large hospital needed to switch from uh, N95s to elastomeric respirators because of the shortage of supplies. And they needed to do it quickly and efficiently, um, fit testing and training their entire staff. And we are not a large company. OHD is only 26 people. So this was quite an undertaking for them and for us. And it required connecting with fit test administrators and even calling in some favors. Um, and so that's just one way that we kind of saw, we also do a lot of work with firefighters. A lot of our customers are firefighters and we saw a lot of um, need there too. But back to research. So all of this research side for OHD falls under my purview. So we, had, we also had a lot of research over this past year on that new device. And that new device was significantly delayed by the pandemic. It was initially meant for a January 2020 release. Um, and because of things that were going on in China, we had some uh, supply chain problems. But it turned out that that kind of ended up being a little bit of a, a, a good thing for us at least. So our goals are generally to advance the field of respirator fit testing, but this can get tailored by the various groups that we partner with. So most of our studies are through either universities or national laboratories um, or some fall to our design partners. 
I actually don't think that there's a single aspect of any of our studies or businesses um, in general that was not in some way impacted by the pandemic. But we experienced many, um, what I like to call, opportunities for growth. Um, so personnel and supply shortages plagued many of our efforts. Um, like I mentioned, a lot of our customers are firefighters. So this is the population that we typically like to use for our research. Um, but as you can imagine, firefighters were and still are spread quite thin, both because they have more calls due to COVID and they also have more folks out with the virus. Many supplies were extremely limited, uh, particularly respirators, most obviously the now very well recognized or at least often mentioned in 95s, but also elast elastomeric respirators and the supplies used for qualitative fit testing as far as our new product went, I think I mentioned we experienced some disruptions in our supply chain for parts of our manufacturing process. Um, this, of course, in turn led to some research and developmental delays for, for the actual product. And during all of that, uh, our workforce at OHD moved remote. So this caused all the beta testing for our new unit to require each individual being assigned an instrument and testing almost exclusively on themselves, a much more narrow pool than we intended. I do know that some of our uh, people roped in uh, family members. Um, as far as other delays outside of that, the other research that we had going on, clearly a lot of the universities closed down. Certain IRBs for the research facilities we were utilizing actually suspended all human subject testing. And some of those have still not resumed. Uh, I'm currently an adjunct professor at the University of North Alabama, and they are one of those that has not resumed any human subject testing, although we do actually have in-person classes. We were closed today because of the weather. Um, other labs were directed to pause any research that was not associated specifically with the pandemic or pandemic response. And this led to quite interesting discussions basically on what a direct impact would be or how far does that extend? For instance, one study that we were performing was aimed at reducing the time it takes for our fit test protocol to be completed. Would or could this reduction in time decrease the what would had clearly become a recently exasperated burden on fit test administrators? Because while OSHA had relaxed their enforcement on repeat annual fit test requirements, there was no change in the need for an initial fit test, which more and more people were suddenly needing, um, including our research fit test operators at one point. We had, uh, when research at first was just trying to minimize exposure, uh, we did a run to fit test all of our um, operators, hoping that that could allow research to continue. But Basically, you know, the bar kind of kept moving. Um, as we all know, we had to be rigidly flexible like we're doing with, with this. I love that from John, I wish I'd had that earlier. But this led me to have to develop a system of prioritization that was two-factored. Which studies had the most potential of actually being completed and which were most justifiable as either pandemic relief or response? Um, all of this has changed the way I now develop and plan my future research. Uh, my scopes of work generally included statements on, on benefits that could be seen to our customers or um, our stakeholders or to just us generally, but now they have overall statements to include the benefit to society. And this helps not only with my system of prioritization, but it also directs me in justification were it ever to be come up and be needed again. Uh, I now also keep a running list of research projects that can be accomplished without human subjects. And because of the pandemic, several of these are on the cross-contamination concerns that have been expressed over the use of fit testing instrumentation and also the reuse of respiratory protection. Uh, one side project that's been developed has been the effects of these different disinfectants that uh, actually Don even mentioned that EPA list of the approved disinfectants and how those are not only impacting all of our products, but as all the different materials that are in or within respirators or respiratory protection. Um, because of the supply and material shortages we experienced, we now utilize multiple different supply chains for everything. And we've even moved to an in-organizational 3D printing process for some things that we're able to store the necessary materials, and then we can just print those items in a pinch. That happened with our uh, adapters during the pandemic. 
But this has led to clearly, a lot of us are safety and health professionals, uh, an entirely new set of hazards in our workplace that we now need to consider. On our customer facing side of OHD, we had a sudden and constant influx of questions concerning the safety of fit testing in a global pandemic. Um, along with these, we now face questions from our customers about liability implications of either acknowledging COVID as a workplace hazard or um, questions about mandating that employees get the vaccine. And now, uh, luckily for me, our corporate attorneys don't let me answer most of those. <laughs> but as far as the safety of the use of the QuantiFit, I've now had to, likely thousands of times, ensure our customers that, that the risk for the virus is other people. Um, because of the way fit testing is performed uh, with our device without the filters in place, and because of how elastomeric respirators function, which is with an unfiltered exhaust valve, neither person in that fit test scenario is being protected. Subsequently, we made recommendations to you know, maintain that physical distancing, perform testing outside or in as open a space as possible, which our technology allows you to do, and to allow time for the area to clear out a bit, you know, um, that just the air to move a bit before having another test subject approach. Um, this was amongst many others. But I mentioned before with the development of this new product being delayed, the pandemic kind of gave us an opportunity to respond to some of these concerns as they arose. So it molded some of the development of our new product. So now the QuantiFit 2 can run off of battery packs. That's gonna allow our users to truly test anywhere, um, contributing to both their ability to physically distance and then also to be in a well-ventilated, preferably outdoor space. Uh, we implemented Bluetooth capability so that the user and operator don't even have to be in the same room. We also developed um, auto start touchless operation, and that was to both minimize um, contact and then also decrease surface contamination. Um, everyone's worried about everything they're touching. These are developments that we might have either delayed or uh, possibly not even considered until the pandemic gave us that nudge. So I feel like I've just gone all over the place. And uh, as much as I would have never wished a global pandemic on any of us, it has contributed to our newest product in what I believe are very positive ways. And I also think it's positively contributed to me becoming a better um, research manager and making sure that I have a lot of eggs in my basket. Um, someone mentioned the, I think it was Phil mentioned the UVC light. You know, that's something that's even come up with, with our product line. Um, can that light, clean our, our tubes. A lot of people are concerned about the tubes for um, their fit testing systems. And uh, we now have filters that we've designed to go on the back of the machine for where it's exhausting air uh, that could possibly be contaminated. Also filters that go into our adapters, just whole new things that um, had the pandemic not happened, uh, we might not have addressed. And it's, it is nice to have those developments, um, even though I, I wouldn't have wanted a pandemic to make it happen. So that's what happened with me with research. All right, thanks so much, Stephanie. Um, yeah, it's, it's interesting the insights of all of you with just the activities here with COVID and how, um, yeah, none of us would have wished the pandemic uh, would take place, but it really has, I think in many instances, caused us all in the field to rethink how we're approaching existing hazards and then how do we put the lens on the emerging hazards as well. Um, before I open it up for some questions and answers uh, here, uh, it's something to think about with one question I, I do have is coming that I frame it with our COVID work that we've been doing, you know, thinking about with research to practice, you know, our activities, I mean, all, all of you have mentioned whether, you know, you've worked with specific industry specific approaches, uh, dealing with uh, populations with English as a second language, um, issues with supply chain and, you know, respiratory qualitative fit testing supplies, things like that, that's affected everybody. Um, in our work, we've done with a to taking a total worker health approach, and we've just been challenged with looking at, is it feasible to take this approach, uh, kind of a holistic approach in a COVID uh, you know, an emergency response and an event with a variety of industry sectors and businesses. So my first question I would pose to you in thinking about, so in translating, you know, working through this approach of research to our practice activities, 
which has been most challenging to you? Has it been identifying the needs of specific work sectors or populations, or has it been designing, you know, planning your activities uh, and how you're going to uh, study it? And then, or has it been the communication issue, which I know we, we all know communication, communication, communication is always an issue in a, in a crisis event, uh, whether it's acute or chronic, but, you know, is it communication around policies or procedures? Or is it setting up how you're going to evaluate what you're doing? So I'll open that up to any of you to uh, chime in. Well, John, I'll go ahead and start then uh, since everybody's jumping in real quick. Uh, let me add that, uh, first of all, we're unique because we have the input from the customers, whether that be public, private, or even in some cases, regulators that are telling us, hey, these are the issues you want to solve. So again, in a lot that I presented, I want to make clear those were ideas to what you called the firefighter, put out the fire, but also it allowed us to define areas we needed to develop, research, development, training, things like that. So your question was, what really motivated? Well, of course, the first thing was, hey, we need to respond to our customers. The second thing we really did is try to take that strategic look, what's going to happen as the secondary, tertiary, and in some cases, even quaternary effect. So that's how we've approached it. I hope that helps with what you're looking for and the participants. Yeah, thank you, Todd. Uh, others, would you like to, uh, your thoughts as far as those challenges? Yeah, so um, we're, we're unique, right? So we, we deal in IP. Uh, and the fun thing about that is it, you, it, you can extract it out of somebody's head no matter where they're at in the world, thanks to the internet, right? Um, so yeah, I, you nailed it. Communication has been the big thing. And it's, it's, been, it's been an uphill climb. And I know, it, uh, to your point, it's been an uphill climb for everybody. But, you know, it's... <laughs> It's unique to see ventilation show up on, you know, your your newsfeed all of a sudden. Um, so to translate that over to work with the nightly news, um, to to get translate this science into something that's palatable for the end person, um, it, it's it, there's a gap there, and the there's a bridge to go over to have people know that they should come to us for the information. I had a gentleman email us that said, you know, hey. I'm trying to figure out when it's safe for my kids to go back to school and what I should be asking the school to do to protect them. And after two days on the internet, I just learned what an industrial hygienist is. Why don't you people ever talk to anybody? Um, <laughs> and it, I was like, you know, I, I'm trying, you know, what, how do you gather information? I'm like, you are the, you're the perfect person to get to. Um, so, you know, a lot of our stuff has been switching from, you know, it, you can get it, you can download it from our website to what, what can we start sharing? What can we share with ASSP? What can make, can we make a one pager? You know, because it's awesome to push that science that, you know, how do face masks work? How do face shields work? You know, is that something that will, will help with aerosols versus the droplet protection? Um, it's one thing to have that information. It's another thing to make it palatable to the end user. Um, and that's kind of been the quick switch. We've been working with industrial hygienists and, you know, we can hand them a journal article and, and they'll take it and they can use it. Um, helping them go the next step and take that journal article and turn around and turn it into something that's illustrated, something that's simplified, that doesn't go into methods and, you know, conclusions, um, something that somebody can read in 30 seconds has, has been kind of our quick shift. Um, so, you know, there's more of that to come to, to try to make this science make sense to the person that the industrial hygienist has to talk to. So. Yeah, and to add to that, you know, in, in sort of the, the 30 second quickly looking at things, um, that was why we focused so much on those infographics. They were short, they were simple. You could quickly look at them and get the information and, and why we wanted to push that out to all of our partners, because it seems like a really simple thing to do to just go, hey, we have all of this information, please get it out to people. Um, but we wanted to make sure that everybody knew that we had all of this and that it's sitting out there publicly on our website and, um, you know, that, so that they're all going to a consistent 
valid source of information rather than um, relying on all of the other stuff that's out there that's maybe not so, so valid and scientific. So I owe a great deal of thanks to each one of these guys because that's what I had to do as I was develop developing stuff for our customers. I had to know where to go, which I utilized ACGIH and AIHA a ton um, for just how to, you know, customers were coming to us, you know, how do I clean my Quantifit most effectively? What is my biggest concern or um, just anything? Because customers maybe don't know about those same resources. So we were able to send out things and post things on social media to say, hey, here's where you can go for some real facts. The biggest one being people thinking that they could now wear their facial covering into a hazardous area. Um, we had a lot of customers struggling with that and you know, you, you can't and you have to be able to communicate that in a really um, understandable but uh, defensible way. Yeah, that's a great point. It's the, when we think about the multiple dimensions of communication I, I just that each of you are talking about I, I I'm just recalling that back early on in the pandemic it might have been late March early April 2020 um, this was really driven home to me when I think about uh, the issues you know sometimes I, I can speak for myself in the academic setting you know we become very siloed in our thinking and our approach at times and sometimes we just make the assumption well why aren't you doing this? Or why aren't you wearing a mask in the case of COVID? It makes sense, it's protecting you. And we don't always think to meet people where they are at with their communication needs. And I think the example I give is I was shopping at a grocery store and I had her on early on in 95 respirator and the uh, person, the cashier checking me out had on a mask but was wearing it improperly. And I was like, hey, let me just give you a little advice about wearing that. And she broke down crying. And I was like, oh, God, goodness, what did I do? And I thought I did something wrong. But she said, you know, I, I, there's so much information coming to me from so, all sides, social media. I've tried to look up things from I, at the CDC, right? Or I, I just now heard of something called NIOSH. I don't know, but I'm scared. I'm really scared. I have a sick mother that lives at home, and I have children. I don't want to be at work, but if I, if I don't, I'm not going to be able to pay my bills. I won't put food on the table. And I, I tried to comfort her, but it really drove home the point in thinking about this, of our approach with what are we doing with the communication and meeting people at where they're at in the variety of stakeholders, you know, when we think about our customer base. So, you know, so thinking about that, let me, uh, I'm pulling up some of the other questions. Mm -hmm. that just for the record, um, I had what seemed like a similar experience at the beginning, um, you know, saw a person in the grocery store, they're not wearing their mask correctly. I thought I would, you know, lend them that hand and they literally growled at me. So there are different places that people are out. Are at with. Exactly. <laughs> well, and, and we're almost to the point where I think we can all feel the information fatigue, right? Like you don't want to hear it anymore. And it's, it's okay, how do we make it even more palatable so that you don't even have to hear it, you can just feel it and see it. And you know, some of those things, um, I, I was watching the news the other night, and it's when, you know, they, they first started saying they, the, the federal government started talking about double masking, right? Mm -hmm. um, every single clip on the nightly news was someone misusing an N95. And my wife just slowly turned and looked at me and she's like, is your heart breaking right now? I'm like, yes, very much so. And, you know, I, I get it. You know, you hear double mask. People still don't understand what a mask is versus a face covering versus an N95. And like, we're trying to hit them with that to, to do what's best and talk about ventilation at the same time. And, you know, I, I, I feel for people because I, I feel it as well. And, you know, we're, we're having two different conversations and I'm trying to shove this conversation down into this subsect. So, um, you know, it's, it's a, it's a good opportunity for growth. I'll steal from you now, Stephanie. I, uh, you know, I, and it, and it, to the whole sphere, you know, it's a, it's a good learning opportunity because after COVID there's still this problem with people aren't wearing N95s right. Um, they're not as inherent as, you know, we think they are sitting around just looking at them um, or even just how they're tested or anything like that. You know, this is people are starting to get a peek behind the curtain. Um, and I think it's a good opportunity for us to 
keep feeding that information a little bit to to help people post COVID as well. So, yeah. You got to hope that some of that's going to kind of come out in the wash because it does feel like we are having, I mean, you said two conversations. I mean, I hear a hundred conversations, different ones. And for instance, even what's sad about the misuse of N95s, you know, we tell the public that they shouldn't be using N95s because we want to preserve them for the healthcare workers who truly need them. But there's also, if you're not using it correctly, then you are definitely wasting it. So there's healthcare workers misusing it, but if we sent that to the public who are even less informed, you're gonna have much more rampant misuse and what a waste of such a valuable resource right now. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> we can hope for the day where the public doesn't need an N95. Uh, but that's you know, a better hope, yeah. Yeah, the, the, um, what, what occurred to me that's really different about this is, is is when you go back and ask, well, what's R to P? And, um, and the, 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 that model was that you develop a good scientific evidence-based uh, hypothesis, then you test it for two or three years, you nail it down, you've got the science, and then you take it out and, uh, and broadcast it widely. And this just throws that model out the door, all right? So what you're doing is working from the very beginning with imperfect information and, and then it evolves. So I, I guess my question to the panel is, and, and all of you in, are really working for a broad range of customers. So this, you don't even have a, a usage focus. Uh, in, in, in a classic sense, is how do you take this evolving knowledge, let people know that they need to stay up to date with it? And then how do you sort out when it's time to change your advice? I mean, during this COVID, I mean, during COVID response, we were having to change what we were putting out at, at least weekly, if not daily. And we were advising our customers to, to just stay with our feed, right? Stay with the social media and we're gonna try to update you as best we can. Um, and even let you know when we don't have an update, you know? That's one thing that ended up being interesting. If you don't put something out for a while, people are concerned that they've missed something. So that was my experience. Yeah, we were periodically going through and reviewing um, our, our materials that we had to make sure that it was still up to date with what was coming out from CDC. Um, our department website was constantly being updated. So, you know, there were, weren't as many concerns there, um, but as far as the materials we were giving out, we were trying to regularly go through and double check those and make sure that they were still um, in line with what we were learning as COVID progressed and, and we were getting more information about it and, and what our behavior should be. I really want to comment on the, exactly what we're all saying. We now want instant gratification, instant messages. Think about how quickly the uh, double masking issue reared its ugly head on one comment that wasn't even intended that way and how we all had to react. And again, you know, uh, as you pointed out, this is not our typical model of research, develop and inform. Our model has been turned upside down. It's almost inform cautiously, research, develop, and then tell them what was wrong with the first information that you need to correct, which really leads to a credibility gap at times. And that's why I know with our clients and even with the consultation group, we're having frequent get togethers and discussions on how do we you know, present information? And quite frankly, that's where I love the short bit micro learning type information that we can present. So excellent, I just love the answer. Uh, another question that has come up, it's building on that, uh, what we were just talking about with uh, thinking about, you know, there's certainly a debate about how, how much has the pandemic fundamentally, has it fundamentally changed the workplace forever with, you know, are more people going to be permanently teleworking um, or doing uh, alternating shifts, things of that nature. But we think about the, the research enterprise here, 
and working to go through this to uh, to the end product. Do you feel like a question for the panelists? Do you feel that it has fundamentally changed that as well? And, and if so, what way? I, I think it's um, it's highlighted something that was already there. I mean, how long have we been talking about? You know, oh, you can automate automate this job. You know, there's whole rankings out there. It's a 21% chance they'll automate the safety guy. That's that's an actual number that I, I don't know how they got to it, but I read that, went through a list. It's like, oh, okay, cool. Um, you know, that that conversation was already being had long before COVID. This highlighted I, us personally, we moved offices. We went to telework. We were kind of going that way. I'm not in Cincinnati. Uh, now we're just a telework company. The end. Um, our office, if we all tried to get there, would be bumping into each other. Um, it's it's a place to get mail. Uh, you know, there's going to be the jobs that you have to be there for because it's physical labor. Uh, but it definitely highlighted we can start to work more efficiently and find ways to work more efficiently, and that might be a reduction in personnel. You know, um, but I think we were going there already. That conversation was being had. And I'm, I'm going to add to that, it definitely changed some things for the positive. And I mentioned some of the virtual work that's being done, in particular, with employees that can recognize hazard, and now employers, whether it's a machine guarding issue, or whether it's, you know, how do I uh, basically use the hierarchy of controls to protect employees, being able to instantly show what I'll call to researchers, this is my environment. What have you done similar? It's been a great positive from that aspect of speeding information that we need to look at quicker. And I think that's one of the positives that will never go back. We have empowered workers. And let's face it, all of us know the more empowered and the more ownership workers have, the better off we all are because that helps us out. So once again, playing Pollyanna, I think there's been, you know, as Stephanie said, I never wish a pandemic again, and but there are some positives that will influence our profession. I guess a question I have is, you know, in, in coming from an ERC and, and, and seeing the others, there was a, 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 a real desire to get out there quickly with information for our constituents. And, and uh, uh, in that process, of course, you've got then all of these parallel feeds. And at some point, you know, that adds to the information overload, I think Philip mentioned, but it's, but, but is there a point where it's going to be more effective to have a focused clearinghouse that everybody, everybody can go to, or, or, or did you feel sufficiently prepared you could pick these bits and pieces out and, and sort it yourself? That, I mean, I could not have felt further from that being sufficient. I think that that's one thing that's been a little bit um, professionally devastating for me was considering myself a public health professional and then, you know, having to come back every week and change the guidance that I'm providing my customers with. And um, it, it didn't feel like until maybe six to nine months into the pandemic that I at least had a grasp on some constants that I could provide both my staff and uh, and my customers. So, you know, when you talk about, would it be better to have some sort of clearinghouse? I would say, yes, that would be better. Um, do I see that being some sort of eventuality? I'm, I'm not sure because different people trust different sources. So on one hand, it would be nice to have this clearinghouse, but so then how many people are aware of the clearinghouse and how do you make them aware of the clearinghouse and how do you consolidate that information? It really just, it just makes more questions. I think that that could also get dangerous. It's, it's convenient, right? We all go to the big box store because you can buy tires and milk in the same place. Um, but at the same time, the guy who you're buying tires from knows nothing about tires. Uh, so if you're in Texas and you need snow tires and you go to one of those places, the guy's just going to sell you tires. Um, and, and that's, that's kind of where we're at with information, you know, 
Um, if if we try to consolidate even just the, the, the safety sphere, you know, there's industrial hygienists, there's ergonomists, there's health physicists. We're all kind of, if you're into one of those specialties, you're kind of looking at it a different way. And the information you want to pass along to other people that are having the same conversation with you um, is different. So, you know, we're always going to have these micro differences that say, okay, trying to lump it together too much is, is going to hurt your outcome as well. Um, but then we do, you know, a big part of this has been, all right, let's build partnerships. So what our specialty is, we can get that information to somebody who might be looking at it a little bit different. Um, and that's something that has been a problem and just because, you know, you, you get tunnel vision, you get to working with the people you're used to working with, and that's, that's who you work with every day. Um, well, and who has the oversight, right? Yeah. I mean, at yeah. least a lot of people around me are really concerned with, um, you know, who's in charge of controlling which information get, mm -hmm. gets put out, I guess. And so if you have this big centralized place, there's going to be, you know, more conspiracy minded people thinking that that's, uh, yeah, <laughs> like, <laughs> you, you know what I mean? And we just uh -huh. over and over again. <laughs> yeah, that's it. <laughs> Well, we can we can make it nicer just by saying that their risk assessments vary. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Very palatable. Good job. Yes. <laughs> Which I guess introduces this whole thing that we that we learned from the keynote this morning that culture makes a difference. Mm -hmm. And you know, as a, you know, I don't hear very many aerosol scientists talking about, well, the, this is the cultural variation of understanding how aerosols move. They have their science. Yeah. Right. So now let's think about this it just as a final segue in the last five minutes or so we have, um, you know, we have several ERC funded trainees, so our students. So the next line of um, occupational safety and health professionals they'll be coming into the field and in in an unprecedented time that we're we're facing now so uh what uh nuggets of wisdom or pearls of advice do you uh have that you could share with these students to as they're coming in at this time based on i would just i would love to tell all the students that it's it doesn't limit you it actually broadens what you can do because I got my degree in industrial hygiene and I didn't know what I was going to do. And since then, I've been a research scientist. I've been a safety technician at a steel mill. Um, I've worked as an industrial hygienist for the army. Um, and now I, you know, a product manager, the, the options are actually endless. You know, I could have gone a different direction with my training as an ergonomist from Auburn. I could have done a whole nother line of things. I just, I think that your opportunities they even exist, even if if you don't know of them yet. No, never stop learning, and I know that's the the non trad answer to things, right? But um, you know, going through school, you're just you're you're learning it, and then the second you get out and you're starting to apply it, um, you know, I've gone back and I I have a certificate in quality management. Why? Because those are real world issues that you know departments are running into. Um, the, you know, you get out there and you identify all of these shortcomings and you just have to know a little bit about all of it to be helpful. Um, so just, just keep learning, you know, uh, honestly find a book on whatever, and it will apply to safety. Um, you know, if you read a book on education theory, I promise you, you'll be a better trainer. Um, if you read something that's, you know, or, you know, you're in a physics class, it's going to help you with noise control engineering someday and communicate that better to somebody there. There's to Stephanie's point, there's a million different things that go into being a good safety person, a good industrial hygienist. So it, it's like I said, it's a very non trad answer, but you almost need education for education's sake, because it will all tie back into what you're doing someday. I want to jump in and agree with both of you guys, but I'm actually going to do a little R&D with you all. And by R&D, I'm not talking research and development. I'm going to say rip off and duplicate. <laughs> but many on this call know Dr. William uh, Weems, who was a mentor to many of us, and he gave the advice to emerging professionals that I still loved and I still quote, 
And Dr. Weems said, be the authentic you, be a lifelong learner, and respect everyone. And if I could give three pieces of advice from just one of the giants in the field of occupational environmental health, that is it. Be the authentic you, be a lifelong learner, and quite frankly, always respect everyone because you never know where that nugget of information is gonna come. So that's my advice. And thanks to Dr. Weems for that nugget of uh, wisdom. I would second everyone with the, the be a lifelong learner. Um, I think that you also just have to be open and flexible because you learn something and then it changes. And so then you have to get up to speed on that. And um, it can be frustrating because you're trying to do all of the right things and, and stuff's just constantly evolving. So I, I think that flexibility to, to be able to keep up and, and recognize, okay, I'm going to have to switch direction now is, is really key to being able to, to keep up and, and keep moving. I really like that acknowledgement of uh, just realizing that, you know, most of us really are just trying to do the best we can with what we have. And I think granting each other that grace is just, is just a huge thing moving forward. And it's always, it's always okay to say that you don't know. That's one thing that, you know, don't ever pretend like you know something that you don't. Mm -hmm. That's a great point. That's, and uh, to put it in uh, more the vernacular of one of my children, as we come here to a close that from movie Finding Nemo, where Dory the fish would say, just keep swimming, just keep swimming. We'll go, just keep learning, <laughs> just keep learning and respect other fish. So, well, I want to thank all of you today, uh, Kesha, Stephanie, Don, and Phil, uh, been fantastic panel. We appreciate you sharing your expertise and uh, we look forward to collaborating with you in the future. And if you have future questions, uh, that you didn't get a chance to ask, or if you're like me, you go, oh, I wish I'd asked that. Uh, just uh, be sure to send an email. You can contact any of the panelists or moderators uh, through the main website for Sears. So we, as we come to a close here, we'll be going to uh, about a 10, 12 minute break. And then we will be coming back for some great pilot project uh, research presentations, uh, resuming at 1255. So we will see you then.